Okay, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Mike Moss. I'm a technical evangelist for the Internet of Everything out of DevNet. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, IOX and EIoT, two of the core uh, IoT technologies that will be available at the hackathon. IOX is a Cisco platform that allows for fog computing applications at the network edge. And that's very generic, but really all it is is the capability of running a guest operating system, a Linux-based operating system, alongside an iOS. Uh, this is done primarily because we're using a, a processor that can do multi-core and we can actually run separate independent operating system alongside the iOS. Um, additionally, you can also run DMO, which Raghu will be talking about uh, as well, as middleware on this platform. And uh, if you aren't familiar, when, when we say cloud, what we're really talking about, or excuse me, fog, is cloud close to the ground. And that's taking all those services or that computational, and in some case even storage logic, and moving it very close to the geographic destination of where this event processing needs to happen, where this process or data needs to be managed. And the, the advantage of that is speed and cost. And in some cases, it's absolutely required, let's say, uh, if it's a router in a bus uh, that's controlling some security element or a train or some type of transportation, you can't actually spend the time sending data up into the cloud and have it come back, back down again for something that has to happen in real time. Um, IOX is really a fundamental tool for enabling this cloud vision for the fog uh, to distribute the, the processing power, if you will, of the IoT out to the edge of the network where things have to be done in real time. And in most cases, uh, you know, the, the data that's consumed there doesn't have to be aggregated back up into the cloud or to some um, you know, operations center. It just can be dealt with there and acted upon there. And then you know, it can be summarized and sent up as a report or not sent at all. It's, it's adding intelligence, if you will, to the network edge. What does it really look like? Well, there's a series of uh, IOX-enabled routers, and there'll be more soon, and there are ones that aren't represented here. Um, across the bottom, for example, we have 819 series, which is what we'll have at the, uh, the hackathon. Um, the uh, one on the right is actually a CGR. It's just kind of there to give you an example of another IOX-capable device. And the use for them is, is broadly varied because uh, they are designed to go into environments that are either rugged or in motion or are uh, extreme in some way. And that's what makes this unique. I mean, they're living at the network edge. They're not in a server closet in a data warehouse. They're really out in the environment closer to where the things are in the Internet of Things. Um, the, underneath the covers, they've got a PowerPC uh, chipset that's running dual core uh, inside, and it allows you to, uh, again, support that like, potentially custom operating system alongside of iOS. Um, in terms of programming technologies, it's, the guest OS is Linux, so really a lot of tool chains uh, can be supported. If you wanted to compile into C, if you wanted to use Python, um, you could even, uh, you know, with a little finagling, get Java on, on there. Um, it's, it's really up to you. And there's the, the tools also are available on DevNet to build your own image, which is probably outside the scope of a 24-hour hackathon. We'll be able to provide IOX images for the devices as needed, but the ones that are on there already come with, for example, Python. Um, an example, so some quick use case examples. Using EIoT, you could actually use a Python server on the IOX guest image and uh, monitor EIoT uh, sensors out on its own little subnet. So you can imagine uh, you know, a router with a bunch of little sensors out beyond it that are all managed from the router itself and only sending information back further upstream um, that's important. So uh, we'll talk about EIoT in a minute, but it's just really an IoT gateway and it lets you collect information from sensors. Um, Another example is use DMO. Uh, there's a, we have a custom image that also comes built with uh, DMO as middleware, and that lets you um, do all sorts of evaluation of the data um, and act on it if necessary. So you can you know, trigger on uh, sensors with sensor data within a range or exceeding something. Um, Ragu will be talking a little bit more in depth about DMO. 
Um, and then the final example is just, you know, whatever you want. Uh, you can custom compile your own operating system and uh, run it as, an, uh, as, a, as a guest operating system and, and use custom applications as you need. So it's a way that if you have something specific for a domain or proprietary logic, you can build your own uh, version of that software and, and distribute it. Okay. The last thing is uh, resources information. Dev, uh, Developer.cisco.com forward slash site forward slash IOX um, is the, the kind of the entry point for developer information around IOX. And I encourage you to go there. There's a great overview. There are uh, documentation on uh, how to get it up and running. There's API reference information. And there's also links to the community from there as well. But the link for it is here is if you need it. And there's uh, great discussions on incorporating IOX on t different platforms and general questions. So it's a good resource if you just want to get more background information. Okay, um, that's it for IOX. Uh, the next one is the IoT. And they're, they're very closely related in that they, they both deal with uh, the edge. Um, Cisco's Enterprise IoT Dev Kit, its purpose in life is to enable and monitor, uh, monitor and control network devices. And uh, it does this through USB via power over Ethernet, which is pretty cool uh, because it lets you not require um, battery or wall plug at the sensor edge. You can run uh, a, a small little Talem adapter out to that, uh, up to 100 meters away from that switch and have a, a sensors or a, a bank of sensors actually attached to that uh, Talem adapter that sends data back into the network. Um, this is interesting because it does leverage wired technology, which is why um, it's primarily called enterprise, because the enterprise tends to have a lot of wired networks already. You can imagine the wired infrastructure throughout a building or uh, even a campus that you could tap into, especially if it, if it supported PoE. Um, the other the last cool trick about it is it centralizes the code and logic for the sensor management on the switch itself. So if you had a switch with eight ports of uh, PoE going out to eight tail adapters that then may be strung four to eight sensors off them a piece, um, you can imagine that you know that's a lot of individual endpoints that you would normally have to update them. In the, you know, on one at a time. Rather than have the logic there, it's held at the switch, and the, um, the, the Talem adapter itself is really just there for acquisition and control of a USB device. So let's talk about what they are. So uh, it's a PoE USB IoT gateway. Uh, in, there's a, a custom iOS image on the switch. And in the bottom left here is a CG, uh, Catalyst 3560 CG. Um, with PoE uh, that connect into the uh, Talem adapter in the middle is showing off the RJ45 with the Talem adapter on the right showing just a different view of the same device with USB on the outside. Um, it's FPGA right through the middle, so there's no software stack or anything to load. It really just translates those USB signals back across the wire to the switch. Um, supports USB 2.0 devices. Um, so, you know, this allows you to support legacy devices. So if you had, a, you know, a custom HVAC system that had a serial input or some other weird kind of device, you can find a USB 2.0 converter for it. You could actually support it. And rumor has it that there will be improvements to this Talem device that already incorporate some of those changes anyway, so you can just do it natively. Um, for this, Python is the primary language um, because the, the, the nice little Cisco edition, there's a uh, Cisco version of Pi USB that you can use to communicate to these devices. And that's uh, pretty easy. It's actually fantastically easy once it's up and running to, to get data off of these things. And again, it's centralized back at the switch. Um, use case examples for this, uh, it's an enterprise grade IoT gateway, which means that anything that you could think of that you could get in as sensor data via USB is fair game. Um, you know, we tend to migrate towards fidgets because they're easy to use, so we use the USB um, uh, interface kits for those that have uh, attachments often that let you easily and quickly incorporate pretty much every sensor you can think of, you know, temperature, light, distance, 
magnetic brake, all sorts of, of interesting sensors. So all those, are, all those cases are covered as well, but you can also do things like radios. You can uh, attach eye beacons to these TALEM adapters. You can put NFC card readers. You can put all sorts of interesting things at the edge and then communicate with that USB de device directly over the network from the switch. Um, the, I guess the, the piece that I should describe is the switch itself is, is, the, is the communication thing, but you actually run your Python code on a separate server that communicates with the switch. So it doesn't, doesn't exist and run on the switch. It's not like IOX and that it runs the code. It actually just communicates with the devices. But uh, again, you could put that code potentially on an IOX image. It could be running on your laptop in the environment. It could be running on a dedicated server. It's just some place where the Python reaches out and talks to via Pi USB to the switch itself. Um, and the last case is using DMO. This is a great tool for tying into DMO, for sending data that needs to be evaluated by data in motion um, for, uh, you know, whatever happens to become. It could be, you know, a, t a temperature switch once it reaches a certain, uh, you know, turn, height turns on a fan. And you want to do that event processing through DMO. That's what it's, that's what it's there for. Um, as with uh, IOX, there's an EIoT site that has lots of really great information. Um, I would encourage you to go there. There's also uh, a newly formed uh, community for it as well. The information that I wanted to give you guys today was um, uh, word, uh, how data in motion works, right? Uh, Mike gave a, uh, a good um, feel for uh, how it could be used, what are the interfaces that uh, uh, can be tied into data and motion. And um, uh, we'll start off with uh, giving you um, a sense of where it sits and how it operates. Right? Um, Mike introduced the concept of IOX to you guys, and IOX uh, is basically iOS with Linux uh, running in one of those boxes, the 819s and the CGRs. And data and motion is one of the Cisco services that we have uh, running on the uh, IOX platform. So Data in Motion is designed to interface with um, um, sensors uh, in, in the southbound direction and provide uh, useful information, typically uh, um, uh, data that is transformed either by applying some basic mathematical operations, such as ranging or greater than, less than, equal to, and so forth, uh, to the domain-specific applications that run in the cloud. Um, how it does this, um, uh, the way data motion works, is uh, it's able to um, go uh, inspect packets and uh, inspect packets not only from the point of view of uh, uh, the protocol headers, but also from the content of the payload. And uh, you're able to write rules uh, to, the, um, uh, to the tune of if my payload contains um, a particular value and the value is greater than 45, then send me the packet. Otherwise, you know, I'm not really interested in the packet. So that's what data in motion enables us to do uh, from an IoT perspective. So how is it useful uh, uh, from from an IoT perspective, uh, especially factory floor automation and, and uh, uh, similar use cases? You want to send information to the appropriate endpoints or appropriate human operators, depending on what the value that you're sensing is, and not uh, uh, just uh, uh, the, the origin of the data or, this, or, or the actual sensor that's sending the data. So typically, you might want to send uh, um, the, the values from a temperature sensor to a floor manager if it's within a, if it's in a particular um, uh, range, or uh, if it's beyond a particular range, you want to send it to security and you know alert them to do something. So that's the kind of use cases that we're targeting. So from the point of view of a rule, uh, how does it look? Well, uh, how does a data and motion rule look? Again, this is like a very um, very fast, like ten minute overview. Uh, there's a lot of content, and I'll point you to the um, uh, the PDFs and the documentation towards the end of this presentation just to give you a feel for it. So our rules are typically following a waterfall model uh, where uh, we have uh, a whole bunch of conditions. And then if all the conditions are met, then we um, uh, perform an action, right? So it's a very simple pattern condition action kind of uh, paradigm. Um, <clears throat> to split to, to go into detail about the um, uh, conditions, uh, we have uh, network-based filters. We basically can filter by protocol and source IP, destination IP, and all that stuff. Uh, 
the next part is the application uh, filters uh, where we are able to automatically understand and index application payloads such as JSON and so forth and then you can write queries on those payloads. So if you have a JSON where uh, that kind of reads A colon 56 and B colon 45, you can write a content query that says A greater than 56. Right? So those are the kind of things that, is, that are enabled and these are enabled you know, in a very generic way from a technology perspective. And then if all of that stuff matches, you can uh, perform an action. The action can be, uh, at this point, one of two actions, uh, which is get payload or get header. Get payload will give you the entire packet. Get header will give you the header of the packet that met the, the conditions. And then um, uh, there are actions that you can perform on a periodic basis too, uh, basically fetch data, GPS update, and so forth. Um, more information about this is available in the documentation. So a brief of how the rule looks in JSON. So what does this enable us to do? So once the rules are programmed, all the data that's flowing in from the sensors can be converted into useful information, the information that the, the application really wants to see and not the boring zeros and ones that are typically being sent to the uh, application and then periodically the application refines the set of rules that it programs on the edge devices and, and that's how you kind of create a, a, a slowly evolving control loop. So um, where are um, uh, the uh, where is data in motion applicable? It's uh, typically applicable for solving uh, our IoT challenges that we're having today where we have limited bandwidth so we don't want to send all the data. We have uh, uh, latency requirements where we want to be able to identify the events as soon as they occur, right, at right where they're occurring, instead of them being archived in some data store and somebody running scripts at the end of the day to find out stuff. Uh, and also from a network reliability perspective where uh, you're able to get uh, uh, the, the sensor reading from multiple edge devices uh, and, and be sure of, uh, uh, be sure that you have a high probability of receiving the information. I don't know why this slide keeps showing up. But anyway, um, some of the solutions that we've been developing with um, Data in Motion and IOX is uh, with uh, the, the, the customers that are here, Shell, Fanuc Robotics, and uh, SK Solutions in the corresponding verticals. So uh, that was uh, what I wanted to give you guys uh, in terms of uh, what the technology is, as well as a brief about the uh, use cases. There's a lot more information available at these uh, uh, locations.